Welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Welcome to the show. February is the month of high-profile executions in Tudor England. We had Mary, Queen of Scots, on the 8th in 1587, Lady Jane Grey on the 12th in 1554, and Catherine Howard on the 13th of 1542. This week, I am choosing to focus on the life of Lady Jane Grey. I recently finished reading Crown of Blood and The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, as well as referencing Eric Ives' biography on Jane. With my fascination on Thomas Seymour, Jane Grey's life nicely intertwines with that of his, and it's a fantastic story to share with all of you. Before I get too deep into the podcast, I want to thank all of you who have made donations to the show or have become patrons on Patreon. Since the last episode, I received one donation and want to thank Pat B for taking the time to support what I do. Thank you so much, Pat. If you're interested in becoming a patron, you can go to patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash tutors dynasty. Click on become a patron to see what options are available to you. For as little as a dollar per month, you can join an amazing group of tutor lovers who support me and have become like family. I've created a page of thanks on my website where I list all of those who are supporting me on a monthly basis. Okay, let's get on with the show. Sit back, relax, turn up the volume, and prepare to be transported back in time to the life of Lady Jane Grey. As granddaughter of Mary Tudor, Dowager Queen of France and Duchess of Suffolk, Jane Grey was born with royal blood flowing through her veins. As the eldest surviving child of Francis Brandon and Henry Grey, she received the education that would have been given to an oldest son. Some have even said they believed her better educated than Elizabeth Tudor. Born in the latter half of 1536, Jane Grey was named after Queen Jane Seymour, who was most likely also asked to stand as godmother to the child. As is usual with royal children, Jane would have been cared for by a wet nurse. It was unfashionable and frowned upon for a woman of royal status to breastfeed their own children. Choosing the perfect wet nurse would have taken time and most likely references. For a royal child, only the best could be offered. We do not know who Jane's wet nurse was, but she would have most definitely been chosen by Frances herself. Jane was not only suckled by a wet nurse, but she would have also had a nursery staff which included rockers, whose job it was to rock her to sleep or to soothe her. Until watching PBS Masterpieces series on Queen Victoria, I had been unaware of the tradition of churching. Well, maybe unaware is the wrong word. I didn't understand it necessarily. In modern day, this seems utterly ridiculous, but back in the 16th century in England, this was commonplace. Churching allowed a woman to return to her normal activities in society. It was a purification ceremony that took place 40 days after giving birth. The custom of blessing a woman after childbirth recalls the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary mentioned in Luke 2.22. The Jewish practice was based on Leviticus 12, 1 to 8, which specified the ceremonial rite to be performed in order to restore ritual purity. It was believed that a woman becomes ritually unclean by giving birth due to the presence of blood and or other fluids at birth. Here is a quote from Leviticus. A woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonial unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from her bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. If she gives birth to a daughter, for two weeks the woman will be unclean, as during her period. Then she must wait 66 days to be purified from her bleeding. With Jane being born in the latter half of 1536, she would have only known an England that did not include Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, her great uncle, as the head of the Church of England. She was raised Protestant, like her cousin Elizabeth, and it was the only religion she ever knew. 
Education played a very important role in Jane's life. It was of the most importance to her father, Henry Gray, who had been well-educated, and he wanted his daughters to learn all that he was taught and more. When Jane was roughly five years old, her formal education began. In this New England, it was not frowned upon for girls to be educated as it once had. In the beginning, she began like most of us, learning her alphabet, which would lead her to reading and writing. She would have also learned and memorized the Lord's Prayer in English. This was of utmost importance. Education was not only learning to read and write, but also to be introduced further to religion. Jane proved to be an enthusiastic student who loved to learn and was eager to be taught. This was something her first teacher, Dr. Thomas Harding, would have noticed immediately. It was around 1541 that the well-known tutor, John Aylmer, joined the household at Bradgate as tutor and chaplain. He had been invited by Jane's father. Aylmer once commented on Jane's intellect, saying, quote, God has fit to adorn with so many excellent gifts, end quote. Jane flourished under the guidance of her new tutor, and everyone, including Francis and Henry Gray, were pleased with her progress. Aylmer once said, It has always indeed been my disposition not only to set the highest esteem upon all kinds of learning, but to regard with the greatest affection those who cultivate and profess it. For I well know how brutish this life of our world be. Were not the understanding of mankind cultivated by useful learning and liberal pursuits. It was under Aylmer that Jane's enthusiasm for religious reform grew. But as it wasn't only learning from books and religion that Jane learned, but also the traditional forms of education to prepare women for Tudor court, she would have learned etiquette, how to sew or embroider, and how to dance and play musical instruments. Jane excelled at history and learning languages. She spoke Greek and Latin, as well as Italian and Hebrew. She also learned French as well as other languages. For Jane, books filled the void that not having someone her age to play with at Bradgate had left. Her sisters Catherine and Mary were younger than her, and Jane was known to read while her sisters played outside. As with any noble or aristocratic child approaching adolescence in Tudor England, Jane needed to further her education in a household of an equal, or better yet, a superior, to increase her standing and the standing of her family. Henry Gray had indicated that his 11-year-old daughter became the ward of Sir Thomas Seymour in February 1547 and was sent to Seymour Place in London. This was not long after the death of King Henry VIII and prior to Seymour's marriage to the Dowager Queen, Catherine Parr. It is believed by historian Eric Ives that Jane's parents were aware of Seymour's intentions to wed Parr and that they were pleased with the arrangement. Sir Thomas Seymour had proposed to purchase Jane's wardship from her parents, Francis and Henry. Henry and Thomas were well acquainted and Seymour enticed the couple by offering them £2,000 for Jane's wardship as well as a marriage between Jane and Thomas's nephew, King Edward VI. Both Francis and Henry jumped at the chance for their daughter to be queen consort and allowed Seymour to purchase the wardship. They understood that soon Jane would be in the household of a Protestant dowager queen, that it would benefit Jane's future greatly. This offer from Seymour was in stark contrast to the offer made by the Lord Protector and his wife. They had attempted to arrange a marriage between their son and Jane. It seems both Seymour men, Thomas and Edward, understood how powerful of a chess piece young Jane could be. It was in her new household that Jane appeared able to spread her wings. She felt a freedom with Seymour and Parr that she had not experienced under the wings of her parents, as any child would feel being removed from their parents in their youth. She also was able to enjoy the company of the beautiful Parr. With Parr as a role model, Jane grew fond of beautifully styled hair and fine clothes, as well as a love of music. These were things that her tutor, Asham, would later inform her were not of the Protestant way. It was in this household that Parr had arranged the best tutors for Jane, and she thrived in her studies on religion and became more convicted in her reformed views. Jane's parents, after a while, were concerned that progress was not being made in the marriage between Jane and the king, since the Lord Protector had blocked both Seymour and Parr from seeing him. Seymour reassured them that he was indeed the king's favorite uncle and that all would be well in due course. Jane, under the care of Seymour and Parr, would have come across her cousin Elizabeth. 
Elizabeth was a few years older than Jane, and so she was not as interested in interacting with her, not to mention that Elizabeth had always understood how precarious her position in the line of succession was since she was still considered the illegitimate daughter of the late king. Jane may have seemed to be a threat to Elizabeth. Even though they had not spent much time together, Jane would have been witness to Seymour's attentions towards the Lady Elizabeth. Jane spent a total of a year and a half under the wardship of Seymour. It all came to an end when Parr succumbed to childbed fever after giving birth to a daughter, Mary. Jane became the chief mourner in the first ever Protestant funeral in England. After the death of his wife, the grief-stricken Seymour chose to disband the household and to send Jane back to her parents at Bradgate. It was after Jane returned to her parents that Seymour realized he had made a hasty decision. He wrote to Jane's father on the 17th of September, pleading with him to return Jane to his care. He understood that Jane's mother would be concerned that her daughter no longer had a strong female influence in her life, and so Seymour reassured her that all the ladies and maids of honor of the Dowager Queen would be kept on at Sudley. Continuing with the theme that Sudley Castle was home to the second court as when Parr was still living. He insisted that everyone would be as diligent about Jane as yourself would wish. He also reassured them that Jane would return to Sudley under the supervision of himself and his aged mother, Marjorie Wentworth, and that he would care for her as she was his own daughter. During these new negotiations, Jane replied to a letter that Seymour had written her. Right, honorable, and singular good lord, the Lord Admiral. My duty to your lordship in most humble wise remembered, with no less thanks for the gentle letters which I received from you. Thinking myself so much bound to your lordship for the great goodness towards me from time to time, then I cannot by any means be able to recompense the least part thereof. I propose to write a few rude lines unto your lordship, rather as a token to show how much worthier I think your lordship's goodness than to give worthy thanks for the same." And these my letters shall be to testify unto you, like as you have become towards me a loving and kind father, so I shall be always most ready to obey your godly monitions and good instructions, as becometh on upon whom you have heaped so many benefits. And thus fearing lest I should trouble your lordship too much, I most humbly take my leave of your good lordship. Your humble servant during my life, Jane Grey. Jane's parents were not convinced that sending their daughter back to Sudley was the best course of action. With the death of the Dowager Queen, Seymour's status had dropped dramatically. Seymour would not take no for an answer, and headed to Bradgate to convince them in person. Once there, Seymour and his friend Sherrington used their wits and charms to the best of their abilities and convinced the couple that Seymour, if he could obtain the access to the king, would immediately arrange a marriage between their daughter and him. This was enough to convince both Henry and Francis that sending their daughter back to Sudley was the right action. The Sudley castle that Jane had left after Catherine Parr's death was not the same as when she returned. There was a noticeable change in the mood at the castle, and it seemed as though Seymour had not yet accepted her death. He had often spoken about presenting a bill to Parliament that would stop people from slandering his late wife's name. It was her marriage to Seymour that so many had not agreed with due to the speed of it after the death of Henry VIII. Around the same time, there were rumors that Seymour was looking to remarry. Some believed he would try to wed the Lady Mary, or even Jane herself. Others believed he was after a marriage with the Lady Elizabeth, which he replied that he had heard his brother would lock him away in the tower if he should marry her, but that he did not see anything wrong with the marriage with the Lady Elizabeth if she were to agree to it. The further Seymour moved toward a possible marriage with the Lady Elizabeth, the more concerned those around him became. His friends and those who served him tried to change his mind, that it was against all that was decent for a man of his birth to go after an heir to the throne of England. One even warned him, saying, It were better for you if you had never been born, nay, that you were burnt to the quick, alive, than that you should attempt it. Seymour's plan not only risked his life, but also the reputation and life of the Lady Elizabeth. It wasn't long after that Jane would have witnessed her father arriving at Sudley to have secret meetings with Seymour. Henry Grey may have believed after these meetings that there would be a double wedding in the near future, his daughter to the king and Seymour to the Lady Elizabeth. 
When the arrest of those involved in the Seymour plan began, Jane was returned to Dorset House. It was there that she would have tried to wrap her head around all the accusations against the man who she had known as a father. It didn't take long for Seymour to be railroaded and found guilty of treason, and on the 20th of March, he was executed by beheading. That's where we'll end for this week. We will continue on with the story of Lady Jane Grey in part two in the next podcast. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Until next time.